Well, hey guys, it's Gary Jenkins. Welcome back in the studio of Gangland Wire. I always forget to say my name. I don't know. Most people do say that, but I think all you guys probably know who I am by now. I would hope, anyhow. So I'm starting a series of shorts about the exploits of the colorful New York City police mob buster, Lieutenant Remo Francescini. It's a hard name for me to say, Franceschini. I got it there, Franceschini. Remo was known to every mob boss in New York City as a tough, incorruptible, and determined dude. And he worked his way up to the different branches of the NYPD intelligence. He started out as a street policeman, of course, got in a shootout, saved his partner, got like the Medal of Honor, whatever they got in New York City, and, and ended up in the intelligence unit, kind of like me. Now, I never got in a shootout and saved my partner, but I ended up in the intelligence unit and started out in the early days working just street mob guys and narcotics dealers. And eventually, by the end, he's taken on the bosses head on, and they all know who he is. Now, he did have a short stop along the way in his career working on the Black Panthers and other groups advocating civil disorder, which I did some of that too. The Black Panthers was gone, but there were some other groups and the Ku Klux Klan here in Missouri. I worked on them for a while. Not very much fun. Not as much fun as the mob guys. One of the early cases he had was he went after a boss who was actually the acting boss after Carmine Galante went to prison on a narcotics conviction. This guy's name was Phil Restelli. He was running the Bonanno family. The Bonanno family was extorting lunch truck operators. Now, we've all gotten a sandwich from a lunch truck, right? And they've got those quilted aluminum backs to them, and they flop down the sides and they have coffee and they have cold drinks and on ice and they have sandwiches, you know, pre-made sandwiches. Some of them are a little more fancy. We always called them tomane wagons. I remember we had one guy that was a little more fancy downtown. He was an Italian guy and he specialized in really good cold cut sandwiches that had salami and prosciutto and bologna and Italian beef. And the big ones we'd call hurt your mouth. They were so big. And had huge, big pieces of bread. They were great sandwiches, though. We also had meatball sandwiches, hot meatball sandwiches, and Italian steak sandwiches, and a variety of other things. And anyhow, these lunch wagons are all over the place, especially at one time. I'm not in that world now. They're still, now they're food trucks. There's food trucks that park downtown. These were lunch wagons back in the day. I still see one every Friday night. I come from a place that I go every Friday night usually and come up in a kind of an industrial area and cutting back through behind out the, on the side streets. And there's a lunch wagon, old fashioned lunch wagon sitting there. There's always three or four people that pulled up in their cars. I guess there must be some little factories around their businesses with the night shift. But in 1973, New York City had thousands of these lunch wagons. And during the 1960s, a guy named Gary Petrole started the Workmen's Mobile Lunch Association. They had 48 members to start off with, and they only charged three bucks a week per truck. They were supposed to help with disputes over territory and maybe pool the money together and get some kind of a group insurance or put together a group to get make large purchases from suppliers and they could get them when they bought large purchases and split them up among the members of the organization they get a better price most of that really never came about but what did come about was the mob got involved here they saw this as a way to get involved now some of these disputes really kind of set the scene for the mob to come in because some guy might have three or four wagons even, so he's a little bigger duck. He might stake out a really lucrative factory or business and then some individual entrepreneur will come see that and they'll come in and set up the same place. And you know, these lunch wagon operators that have fights breaking out between each other, they would start price wars. Now the organization was supposed to deal with that. They didn't deal with it very well. And within a couple of years, uh, Mr. Petroli was replaced by a guy named Louis Restelli. Guess who? the nephew of Phil Rostelli, the Bonanno boss. Now, he brought in a guy named Anthony DiStefano, who was elected secretary treasurer of the association. So this pretty much put the mob in complete domination of that lunch wagon operators organization. And first thing they started doing was extorting money from food suppliers to the lunch trucks. They demanded kickbacks. It was kind of computed on a percentage of the number of purchases made by their organization's 
members. And of course, then they started lining up other individual operators saying, you got to join our organization or else what? Well, the old school like extortion thing, I'd hate to see anything happen to your truck. I'd hate to see you have some flat tires some morning when it came out, or I'd hate to see somebody throw a Molotov cocktail at your truck. Maybe some of these kids out here, we can't control these kids sometimes. They may come along and rip you off. And so pretty soon everybody's belonging, joining the Lunch Wagon Operators Association. Of course, the next thing is they start extorting money from the lunch truck operators. Maybe they would like sell them a good lucrative organization. Or maybe you have somebody that was connected to a mob guy who was connected to Restelli. And pretty soon some thugs would show up and bump what they call bumping a competing truck from a lucrative location I talked about. So it was totally mob dominated and you had to be in with the mob, which meant you had to kick them some money in order to get their help and they run the thing. Well, this was a case when the New York City Organized Crime Strike Force took it on, and Lieutenant Remo Franceschini was part of that. And with these types of investigations, you start off, you just get word from informants, for example, or somebody, maybe you know somebody in that business who's complaining about these mob guys. Nobody will ever bring a regular complaint. Nobody will ever call the police for the most part. But you start hearing about it, so then you start an investigation. You don't really have any evidence. You don't have any cooperating witnesses start off and you can't really go anywhere. But they created what they called Operation Hot Dog, great name for it. And they started trying to find cooperating witnesses because they knew it was going on. Well, you go ask these guys and they say, I don't know what you're talking about. Who, me? I don't know any mob guys. But pretty soon they get word from a New York City street cop who had a relative who had gotten a beating from some banano thugs because he wasn't falling in line. So they approached him, got his cooperation, got the New York City police copper, his relative, to buck him up. Because you got to buck these people up. You're going to ask them to stay involved and gather evidence for him and eventually be a witness. That's a dicey thing. And pretty soon he did do that. He agreed. And they started learning about other connected businesses, other lunch wagon operators that had a whole bunch of lunch wagons. Who were the suppliers that were favored by the mob controlled organization? which meant the mob was influencing these suppliers to do certain things and getting kickbacks. So slowly but surely, you gather all that evidence, and the U.S. attorney starts putting these cooperators before a grand jury. Well, during that time, the FBI got kind of bored and sent most of their agents on to other matters, which was more exciting. And this was kind of a minor case, just a simple mom and pop, I would say, operation, a mom and pop extortion that goes all the way back to the corner candy store and the young thug gangs that would come by and say, you don't want any trouble here. We can handle this if you have any trouble, but you got to kick us every week. And so Remo and his intelligence guys take up the slack and they have to continue guarding these nervous cooperators. They've got some cooperators but they get nervous and sometimes even have to run protection details on them. You got to give them your phone number. They'll be calling you in the middle of the night and ever jump on something they happen to hear outside their house or they think somebody's following them and they'll drive you crazy. So, but you got to do that. You got to keep them bucked up. Otherwise, they'll just say, you know, I'm out. I'm out of this. It's not worth it. Now, this is where the work gets tricky. TV detectives, they get into shootouts. They have car chases. They have foot chases. But, you know, when they say shoe leather makes cases, that means you got to get down the streets, you got to work. You got to spend time watching social clubs, bars, eating joints, athletic clubs, front businesses, other places where mob guys show up. Pretty soon you catch a meeting with minor criminals, sports gamblers and other citizens. And from these other citizens, pretty soon they see some of these lunch wagons, like a guy that owns four or five lunch wagons or a guy that's a high up executive or owns some kind of a supply company that's connected to the lunch wagon business. Pretty soon they see them meeting. They found some regular meetings, even with Phil Rostelli. And so then you go back and you got to find out everything you can about those particular people. And if you got to get lucky, you got to figure out some way. You got to get a lever on them, usually. You start watching them. You saw them meeting with Restelli one-on-one. Then you see them following back to their business. And then 
you follow them everywhere they go, or you start looking into their criminal record. Maybe they've got a DUI. Maybe they've got some pedophile charge out there. You get lucky. That's a good one there because you can deal with these smaller charges. Maybe you see them going into a sports bar and making sports bets. Maybe you see them pick up a street prostitute. And you get some street policeman to come along and pop him real quick. Or anything you can get to get any leverage on this guy who's doing business with the mob. Because guys doing business with the mob don't really want to talk to the cops now, do they? <laughs> so finally, you find a few likely targets and you confront them with what you know. And they identified several of these businessmen who had direct conversations with Phil Rustelli made him into witnesses and put him in front of the grand jury. So he's charged with several underlings and actually Remo and his squad with all this shoe leather they put out, they wore out, made a good enough case to convict Phil Rustelli, a mob boss at the time, acting boss on these extortion charges. Not a big case. He didn't get a whole lot of time. Now, some of the guys, we had one of the guys that was that worked for Remo. It was Anthony Solano. I got a look back and just run that C-E-L-A-N-O, just search that in my back catalog. You'll find an interview with one of them. We talked a little bit about some of his following Gotti around and some of the other cases that he worked on. Vincent Marino, Charles Martin, and Anthony Falco. So I feel like I should really mention these guys' names because they did a hell of a job. They were the untouchables in New York City when the, during the NAP Commission and all that other stuff came out and the narcotics people, they were taking money and doing everything. The intelligence guys never fell. They never were involved, just like our Kansas City Police Intelligence. They're really careful about who they take in. They watch each other and they don't get too high flying. Now, during the trial and a subsequent appeals case, Rastelli and some of his other co-defendants, I didn't even look up to see who those were, just more minor mob guys at the time, probably nobody had ever heard of. The argument, their defense was, well, they freely paid us to help them out. And, of course, the charge was that they'd violated the Hobbs Act because they had participated in a scheme that obstructed or delayed or affected commerce or the movement of any article or commodity in commerce or interstate commerce by robbery or extortion or any attempt to do any of that or threaten any physical violence in the furtherance of this plan, which is what this is all about. And they had enough evidence to do that, although here's how it works. They just drop by and they already know that violence has been committed on some other lunch wagon operator. So they just drop by and say, hey, how you doing? You're kind of vulnerable out here on the street. We want to be your friend. See you later. And pretty soon the guy's saying he knows what he's got to do. He's got to kick him some money every week. So that's how it works. But the court ruled that even though the payments may look voluntary on the surface, previous acts by the defendants set an atmosphere where if you gave them money, then their life would be easier. So that was kind of like what came out of that. I never even thought about that. I was listening to a mob guy talk to another man, and it was all friendly and everything. So I'm telling this FBI agent, and this was just an overheard conversation in a restaurant, actually. So I'm telling this FBI agent, my friend Bill Owsley, and he said, well, he said, just think about it. He said, yeah, he sounded all friendly and everything, but what's behind that? You got to look to see what's behind that. Is there an implied threat behind that? You don't really know about the words themselves may not sound like they're dangerous or like they're threatening or anything, but you got to know what's behind it. So I learned something there. So now, guys, the second case. Remo Francesini and his intelligence squad had a hidden microphone placed in the office of an oil distribution company in Brooklyn. That place was owned by a Gambino soldier named Petey Pumps Ferrara. I never heard of Petey Pumps. You guys ever heard of Petey Pumps? I couldn't find out much more about him. And one day, some unknown guys from New Jersey showed up for a meeting. The guys, they'd been listening to this setup of this meeting. They knew there was something dirty going to be talked about. But they didn't know what. So the guys get in there and Pompsy starts telling about how his daughter was a nun <laughs> and, and how he had recently sent a great big fire bouquet to the mother superior and how thrilled the mother superior was to get those flowers. And he's talking about that. And then he just pivots in a breath and he says, OK, let's get down to business. This guy, we got to whack him out. We're going to kill him. This guy's no good. This is all business, and this is how we're going to do it. You're going to walk in, you're going to say, this is a stick-up. 
Now, we'll have a backup car in case any of the blue people are around. We all know who the blue people are. Then you'll move. If you have a problem, just go to the subway, get to Times Square in front of the Paramount Theater. If you don't make your moves in a car, we'll know by then and we'll have somebody to pick you up in front of the Paramount. And he ended the conversation as these guys left. Now, don't feel bad. This guy's really got to go. You know who gave us this one, don't you? Big Paul. He's in on it. Well, he's the cousin. And the men walked away from the microphone. Now, Big Paul, he's the cousin. Paul Castellano. Remo and his crew start scrambling to identify this New Jersey crew. Who might be the target? And they couldn't figure it out. But they knew that something was going to be happening in pretty imminently. I've been on these deals. You know something's going to happen and it's pretty imminently. Ours was they overheard Nick Sabella tell somebody on the phone that he wanted all unfinished business taken care of by the time he got released, which we knew was in about six months. And we had about three murders in the next six months. But you can't be everywhere at once. He did assign the famous detective Anthony Salerno. Anthony Salerno worked in the intelligence unit. He became famous. He wrote a book. It was one of the first early mob books. He testified in front of Congress. I knew a detective that worked with him in the intelligence, and I met him at a LEIU conference. And I asked him about Salerno. He's a guy hardly ever went on the street. All he did was read reports and then got famous by going to testify in front of Congress. But According to Remo, he had Anthony Salerno and a guy named Jimmy Gary sitting on pumps with shotguns and don't lose him. And you could be caught in the middle of a mob hit because he might leave and go be part of this hit too. They didn't know. They believed it was a real hit. And because of kind of the way the mob worked, Carlo Gambino worked. He gave these orders to the cousin Paul Castellano, who then gave the contract to an underling like Peter Pumps Ferrara. Then Ferrara handed out this assignment to more lower-level New Jersey-based associates, so that keeps everybody insulated from this. Of course, Remo's thrilled. I mean, here we are. <laughs> he got a chance to be waiting at the scene of a mob hit just before it goes down. I mean, there's nothing better than that. And that is rare, as scarce as hen's teeth, as we say out here in the Midwest. The only problem was they didn't know who the intended victim was. They didn't know when it was going to go down. And New York City is a huge, big city, as we all know. They did get the New Jersey guys identified, a couple of unknowns. The intelligence squad and New Jersey state troopers tried to keep them under surveillance, which is really hard to do. But as best they could, they kept them under surveillance. And after a month or so of doing this, dedicating all this manpower, and boy, I've seen this happen. Month of manpower, everybody's devoted to this, nothing happens. Then PD Pumps went out of town for some reason, so they just stopped it. They just, okay, we're done. Maybe it's already happened. For all we know, they've already killed somebody, some minor guy, and we just weren't there, and it didn't come to anybody's attention, the press attention. But about a week later, two weeks, three weeks maybe, I'm not sure, sometime the next month, the homicide squad got hold of them and said, hey, there was a hit, that, a murder that went down that's kind of strange that, out in Brooklyn in a flower shop, a guy named Sant'Antonio, the homicide squad came to Remo and said, hey, we got a suspicious hit that went down. A guy working in a floor shop, actually he was his father-in-law owned it, name is Sant'Antonio, got killed. And it was funny. He said two guys walked in and said, this is a stick up and just shot him down, but then left, didn't take any money. There was a witness there, the father-in-law, who, of course, wouldn't cooperate in any manner. So Remo's squad shared what they knew with the homicide squad, and they learned through the homicide squad that the FBI had been using this guy as an informant, and he was a member, a lower-level associate of the Gambino crime family. Like, damn, damn, that's it. That's it. It couldn't be there, but that's it. So Remo said he later would share what he had with the FBI, but the relationship had been damaged for quite a while at that time. And I don't know, they'll eventually repair it. But during this time, they just had a really bad relationship. The Homicide Squad could not make a prosecutable case just based on the tape conversations because they were inadmissible. They were pretty vague and they were like what we used to call gypsy wires. This is probably just nobody ever really reported them or made a complaint to the feds. It would have been illegal on a federal level to have this kind of a wire, this kind of a hidden microphone. 
Now, speaking of the friction between the FBI organized crime squad and Remo's intelligence unit, this kind of goes back a few years before this. I believe it was maybe 1967. Anyhow, it was in the 60s. They observed an incident where an FBI agent was attacked by some Gambino soldiers, and they did nothing in order to preserve their own surveillance because they were watching, didn't want anybody to know who they were and that where they were watching from. And this really had always been a source of friction between the intelligence squad and other cops and agents. We get schooled. You don't ever reveal yourself unless it's a matter of life and death. I've watched bar brawls go down and done nothing unless I could get to a phone and maybe call somebody. I've watched smart, small time car prowlers and burglars at work. I never revealed myself and before we had cell phones. So you had a, like a secret frequency radio that very few people were on. You might get a call somebody on the radio if you're in a fixed place or you didn't want to move and tell them to call 911 and report what was going on. But maybe you didn't even want the cops in there at all because of something else that we were waiting for or watching for. And so you just let it go down. I remember one night, <laughs> me and another guy, we're just so schooled in this. We're sitting outside this bar waiting for somebody to come out, I believe. And we saw these crowd just boil out of this place. And there's two women in the middle of them. And they are just beating the dog shit out of each other. Just pow, pow. I mean, they're screaming and pulling hair. It was a hell of a fight. And there's this whole big crowd of howling drunks all around them cheering them on, you know. I just say, not my monkey, not my circus. All these people, they bought their tickets to the fair there, and they'll play it out. I don't need to get involved in that. And then pretty soon it was over. So back to this problem between the FBI and the intelligence squad. Here's an important source of that. Partly the FBI didn't trust them, thought they were all on the take, of course. But there was a very, really important Gambino capo named Carmine Lombardozzi. He ran probably the most significant and successful crew in Brooklyn. In 1957, he was also arrested with five other Gambino Capos at the Appalachian meeting. That's how important he was. Now, his crew earned a lot of money in loan sharking, gambling, labor racketeering, and trading stolen securities. And this was early on in that business. Now, Edmund Valen of the American Mafia website noted that Lombardozzi pioneered white collar crime like this for the mob, like stealing stock and bond certificates or finding somebody that had stolen them and then getting, taking them, buying them for like cents on the dollar and then reselling them. Or maybe they would get somebody a shill, would go to a bank and put them up as collateral. The bank would just put them and hold them in a safety deposit box and use them as collateral for a big loan. And this was long before Paul Castellano. This is when he was like a young kid where he got involved. And he was the early guy into that and pioneered that business for the New York City families. But Carmine Lombardozzi made a few mistakes along the way. Even though he was a big money maker, he did a couple of no-nos. And one of them was he was married and he was having an affair with the daughter of one of his underlings, a guy named Sabato Miro. This is a huge no-no, as we all know. And Muro made a complaint on him. They had a sit down and it came out that he was having this affair. Now, Carmine could only save himself by, get this, this is old school, this is old country kind of stuff here. This is Sicilian stuff. He saved himself by divorcing his wife and marrying the daughter of Sabato Muro. Now, I bet Christmas is around those families for something else. Oh, my God. I don't know how you live like that, but people do. Then not long after that, he found himself in hot water again and really got the wrath of Carlo Gambino. 1963, Carmine found himself in hot water with Gambino again. He really incurred the wrath of Carlo. His father, Camello, I think, Lombardozzo. In 1963, the father of Carmine Lombardozzi died. A funeral was held at the Church of the Immaculate Heart of Mary in Brooklyn. Now, Carmine and his brother, John Lombardozzi, and some other guys saw FBI agents out in front, as agents and police do, with cameras and take, writing down license numbers and taking pictures of people. And they went off. They attacked the agents. They got control of one of the agents, a man named Foley, took his gun away from him and beat him severely with it. 
before other agents, they had some other agents in the area, of course, could get to them and uniformed officers were on the scene and they got and they broke it all up and arrested Lamborghini and the, both of them and another guy, I believe. Remo would later say that his men were on the street watching from a distance, but they had a lot of cases going against people that were in attendance there, and they didn't really want to reveal their identities, what they looked like when they would go back and do surveillances or maybe hang out in the bars where these guys were and those kinds of things where you try to get up close to people, see what they're doing and what they're involved in. And he would actually say, we feel like the FBI was responsible for what happened. When people are having a funeral, you don't just go up and aggravate people. You do things covertly. You keep your distance. Intelligence guys don't do that. Now, intelligence guys don't like to get caught in a trap that forces them to testify in open court. And Remo spoke to one of his guys who was shooting off his mouth everywhere to other coppers and everything that said, you know, that stupid fed bastard got right in the middle of this thing. What a jerk. He deserved what he got. Of course, that didn't endear him to the FBI either. <laughs> Told him, he said, you better stop shooting off your mouth. But the guys learned about it. And tell those guys, we don't like to testify because that puts our face out there in front. I testified one time and I was a sergeant by that time. Mainly, we really worked and we were instructed, don't get yourself in a position to testify and be up on the stand where everybody can see what you look like. And in our case, it was other coppers too, because we like always had an offsite. And I bet these guys did too. You got an offsite. You don't go into headquarters very much. You may, but just except for people that really knew you back when you were in the streets or you were a detective, try to like keep people from knowing you because you might end up working on policemen too. But in the end, Carmine and his brother got convicted, did a little bit of time, assault on a federal agent, did a little bit of time. Now, what happened, that American Mafia website that I was talking about before reported that this assault on an FBI agent stimulated so much more federal attention on the Gambino crime family and all their operations that the normally low-key Carlo Gambino demoted Carmine Lombardozzi and he kicked him back to being a soldier and promoted a guy named Joseph Gennaro to lead that crew. But, you know, this guy was a sharp guy. Even with all this trouble being demoted, Carmine continued to do well in his reduced role, and he ended up dying of natural causes at age 79 in 1992. And so that's a few short stories about our friend Remo Francesini. Don't forget, guys, I like to ride motorcycles, so watch out for motorcycles when you're out there. Don't forget that if you've been in the service and you have PTSD, go to that VA website and get that hotline number. And if you have a problem with drugs or alcohol, our good friend, Anthony Ruggiano, on his website, he has a hotline. If you're on my YouTube channel, you can see the hotline right now, that hotline number. And he's in the business, I believe, down there in Florida. So if you call them going to treatment down there in Florida, he might be one of your counselors and everything. And that would be kind of cool, wouldn't it? I guess if you have a problem with drugs or alcohol, being the mob guy to be your first counselor and help you get sober and get straight, clean and sober, as they say. But anyhow, so don't forget to like and subscribe. And I appreciate all you guys out there and all the support you've given me in the past. And I'm going to continue to put these out. Thanks a lot, guys.